Thank you very much. Uh, Passive House, well, as the uh, title suggests, Passive House and integrated project design do play a, a factor in this presentation, which you'll see as we go along. But yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Stuart and I would like to share our experiences working on this 16-unit uh, nonprofit seniors housing project that was completed earlier this year in Tilsonburg, Ontario. In 2017, I got a call from the folks at the uh, Tilsonburg Nonprofit Housing Corporation. They're the client here. And uh, they asked if... Uh, uh, they told me about a program that they were interested in doing a uh, 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 an uh, qualifying for um, the Oxford County Build Better program, which was uh, initiated by Oxford County to with two two objectives. One was to uh, provide additional affordable housing in the, in the county, and the other was to address their very ambitious climate action plan, so to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And um, they came up with funding uh, a funding. Uh, uh, formula that the uh, applicants could uh, acquire if they met one of two criteria, one being pH certification, the other one being net zero. Um, after doing a, a feasibility study, we found that net zero was going to be the more feasible, more practical path, which is uh, what we eventually did. So one of the recurring themes that came up, uh, because these are seniors, was, okay, well, what's comfortable? What's a comfortable set point? So in the passive house world, we use 20C, 20 Celsius as the, as the design set point. Um, I live in, an, uh, in a near passive house um, in Oakville, and my mother, who's a senior, thinks it's a piece of crap. <laughs> She's always cold when she comes to my house. So I have some first-hand experience with this, but this was taken in her senior's residence, not far from where I live, and I was planning on staging the thermostat control, but I didn't have to, because when I got there, it was already at 26.5. <laughs> and if she had a pair of channel locks there and could crank it another couple of degrees she would, but it, it doesn't go any higher. So obviously seniors have different thermal requirements, so this is a fireplace that's on in the lobby from, I believe it's, I believe it's on from October 1st to September 30th, so <laughs> something like that. The good thing is they don't use much cooling, they just like to recirculate damp, musty air in the summertime, so that's going to save, and that's the most overworked, uh, that baseboard heater there is largely responsible for the global warming in, in Oak Hill, for sure, anyways. <laughs> there isn't any snow on the roof, put it that way. Um, but set point has, plays a big, a, a big factor in comfort and in also energy consumption. So if you look at the example up above, at 20C, the annual heat demand for this project came in at 30 kilowatt hours, which is 33,000 kilowatt hours per year for heating. Well, as you go to 22, it now goes up by 19%. If you go to 24, it goes up by 39%. If it goes up 26, it's up 58% over the 20C. So this is something that we had to struggle with as we were looking at sizing the PV system and, and what the overall en energy situation was going to look like in, uh, from a net zero standpoint. Okay, so the IPD project team listed on the right. I won't name everybody there, but to say that they were all awesome. Um, they all came on board pre-building permit, but a lot of the uh, architectural design was already advanced and the, they already had site plan approval. So our, our options were kind of limited as to what we could do. Nonetheless, everybody work together uh, pre-permit to sort of get the details in place that we needed to, to uh, meet the net zero goal and it was a really, really solid experience. It was my first IPD experience and it was really fantastic. I'm really lucky and proud to have been par part of it. Um, this picture shows the uh, uh, Raft Foundation. The site was quite amenable to a slab on grade. Uh, this particular system is supplied by Legolet. Um, it's an engineered uh, slab with eight inches of EPS on the bottom for R32, eight inches of concrete, um, there's no thickened edge, it's actually, they use a thicker slab throughout and reinforce where necessary, so there's no thickened edge on it, it's sort of a uniform, uniform depth slab. Um, you can see the yellow heavy stego wrap there, that was the air barrier, continuous air barrier that which flowed underneath and was obviously connected to all the, the drain pipes that you see there. The um, stego wrap is sandwiched between two four inch layers of EPS. And one of the really cool things about this particular product is that it has a, uh, an edge element which is there's extra four and a half inches of insulation that protrudes off the side of the, um, of the raft assembly, that's, the slab raft assembly that's going to marry up with the wall insulation. So you really have continuous insulation uninterrupted all the way up. Thank you. Five minutes to do 12 slides. I'll see what I can do. No problem. Thank you, Yuri. This is um, uh, just a, a section drawing that we were able to send to the building department. So one of the really great things that happened is the building department was really on board with the whole Oxford County program and with this project. And um, they were able to give us guidance early on in the process, particularly with some of the details regarding the fire separation in the, in the roof assembly. Um, it was, was something that 
was going to be tricky to plan, to detail properly, to, to achieve the high level of air tightness that we were looking for. And they were able to give us some guidance like pretty much the same day we asked for it. It was uh, hugely helpful. Here's some of the numbers. 100% um, electric systems, uh, 1,200, 12,000 square foot building, 2.9 million final cost, which was about $244 a square foot. That's including the PV system. $17 of that was a PV. Um, there's a summary on, on, the, on the, the assembly components. There's a fairly simple building, slab R32, walls R40, roof R80. Um, first time that this particular GC had done this type of construction. We had a modest but nonetheless ambitious target of 1.0 air changes per hour, and in the end we came in at 0 0.75, so they did a, a great job on the details. Uh, fairly simple detailed uh, details as far as the assembly goes, and again, they just paid great attention to it. They got some good guidance from some of the suppliers involved as well and uh, did a really nice job of connecting all the, all the connections that needed to be connected. The big challenge was the roof assembly. Again, there has to be some fire separation walls put out across this assembly, but basically carrying the, build the air barrier continuity across the roof was, was uh, very challenging. We ended up, in the, in, you can see in the center part, there's sort of an open corridor there that ended up being a service cavity, which is under this walkway here that you can see. And then there was 80, R80 blown cellulose blown into the attic. This is the interior version of the air barrier continuity there. Um, there's, uh, it had to transition from the outside of the building to the inside because of the way the truss assembly worked on it. You can see there it is with the uh, vapor control, vapor barrier and uh, uh, drywall and the, some of the mechanicals already in place. You can see the, the, the plumbing vents transitioning inside the building envelope there. Um, this was a panel, uh, the, the, the general contractor was able to panelize a lot of the, the, the construction. All the exterior walls and the ceiling platform you see being craned in the place were all done off-site. It made for incredibly speedy assembly. And um, uh, there were some lessons learned along the way, though. It would have been good, I think, to tape the joints, uh, the panel joints at the factory. Um, it might have posed some, comp some pr uh, challenges with, with shipping, but I think we could have overcome those. Um, the vapor control layer was great. It was to have it installed at the, um, at the, at the factory, as you can see here, the, uh, the, the poly, but it rained like crazy and it all got soaking wet. And every single one of those bays had to be cut open, dried out, and then reinstalled afterwards. So, uh, taped afterwards, so it was lessons learned. Um, and finally, this is the above uh, wall, uh, above ground wall detail. Uh, again, this uh, EPS product, four and a half inches of EPS, also supplied by Legolette. There's a snap track system that, that uh, installs I'd worked with it on another, on a, another project. Basically, it was really, er, really easy for the, uh, for the build team to learn how to use. They were able to order it with the already cut to size below the windows. Um, it's married, it's the same thickness as the slab insulation edge, so there's a, a perfect mar marriage between the wall insulation and the slab insulation. And you can see the other details there, the zips, the zips sheathing um, connected to the air barrier. And, um, as far as windows, and there's the building to the right, you can see that's with the, with the strapping put on for the siding that was going to be put on there. They ended up with a, a, a facade of a cement board, of a fiber cement. Windows were triple glaze UPVC and so, sourced from a local supplier. The general contractor already had a really solid working relationship with a, with a local supplier, and we decided to go down that road um, just to facilitate any service work that would have been required down the road or whatever. So, um, And that's basically it for me. I'm going to pass it over to, to Stuart. Okay, thanks, Ed. Hi, everybody. So the first thing I want to talk about is the value of having solar at the design table. So as Ed said, we got involved in the project after site plan was done, the elevations were done, the floor plans were more or less done. So the hip roof, or sorry, the gables you saw on the first slide was mirrored on the south side of the building. So it was on the roof, on the street side for some architectural interest, and it was mirrored here. So our solar team worked with the architect and the, and the structural engineer to redesign the south roof to make it more accommodating for solar. So you can see we have an uninterrupted array now. Uh, the other thing we did was change the, uh, the roof type to standing seam metal roof, which allowed us to use the S5 clip system to mount the racks. So what you end up with is a completely penetration-free roof. There's one stack for the electrical lines to go inside the roof, and that's it. So no penetrations. Uh, so by the numbers, we've got an 88 kilowatt array. We were producing, or simulated to produce, just over 100 megawatt hours a year. Uh, the simulated consumption of the building is 80 megawatt hours a year, so we're producing about 130% of the consumption. So that's plus or minus 10 or 15% annually based on weather and, uh, and degradation over time. 
Uh, plus the big wild card there is the 80 kilowatt hour, 80 megawatt hours per per, or per year for consumption because we really don't know, you know, occupant behavior. That's including plug loads and everything. So again, with you know, if virtual net metering becomes a thing in Ontario, this is a client that can benefit from that because they own so many properties. So another thing when it comes to designing the solar system, again, the north side was the street side. Naturally, you'd want to keep all the plumbing stacks away from the street side which presented a challenge because that's exactly where we wanted to put the array. So what we did was gang together all the vents in the, uh, in the walkway that Ed showed you a minute ago, and we only penetrate the roof in three locations, which I realize are probably kind of difficult to see, but there's one of them, there's one in the middle and one at the other end. So that was uh, a bit challenging. Coordination is obviously critical, so what we did was highlight zones on the drawings exactly where we wanted the plumbing contractor to put everything, because you can imagine they were there months before the PV system was, and the last thing we wanted was one of these to be off by even a few inches. That would mean we couldn't have the complete array up there. So continuing on with plumbing and drainage systems, you know, Ed's, Ed was talking about the GC, you know, this being a first working with that system. This was a first for the plumber working with, with a raft slab this deep. And there's no frost walls to measure from at the time that they're roughing on all the drains. So you can see they were using string line to do this, and they did it quite successfully. Um, they were concerned about the depth of the traps in the end, because you can imagine you've got uh, eight inch slab and eight inches of insulation. It's not that different from a normal slab on grade, but when we went through for our final walkthrough, the plumber's question to me was like, what happens if something drops down in one of those traps and I have to get it out? And I, I don't have a good answer for him. I don't know how, good, how big a problem it really is gonna be, but that was, that was his concern working with the system for the first time. Um, so on the HVAC and, and hot water side of things, uh, one of the first questions we usually ask is who's paying the utility bills? Because if it's on the house, then we can use different strategies than if it's uh, being put on the tenants. In this case, it was on the house. The, the tenants were not paying, so we could have gone to a centralized system. And had we been involved from the very beginning of the project, we probably would have done so. But in this case, just because of the geometry of the building, it wasn't necessarily easy to do that on the ventilation side of things. And we didn't have enough space to really do that on hot water. So. One of the downsides is that we're locked into having one electric tank in every suite, um, which means there's not really a lot of potential to improve upon that. And it's not practical to put a heat pump water heater in a 500 square foot apartment. Uh, and we've gone to a decentralized, compartmentalized ventilation system. So what that looks like is uh, we're using one set of ductwork to distribute the ventilation and the heating and cooling. So we've got the ERV distributing downstream of the fan coil and then mixing and being distributed into both the bedroom and to the open space. So one of the reasons for doing that is that if the space temperature is satisfied, then we don't need to keep running the fan coil fan unnecessarily. So uh, we can, uh, the two are eff effectively decoupled in that scenario as opposed to the normal way of doing it where you'd inject it in the return side, let it mix and distribute. We've done this on a bunch of uh, office buildings over the years with success. So it's the first time we've tried it in an apartment building. But one of the keys to that was having an ERV that had a high apparent sensible effectiveness so that even in the dead of winter, if the fan coil happened to be satisfied for some reason, we're not dumping cold air on people in this scenario. So uh, this is a heat recovery VRF system, which uh, you know the building is long axis along the east-west uh, axis. So we have north suites and south suites. And while we may not realize a, a lot of energy benefit from the heat recovery system, at least we've got simultaneous heating and cooling. So we pitched the idea of that to the owner and they were on board with paying the premium to be able to have everybody being in either heating or cooling mode, depending on, again, the, the wild card of how are, how are people gonna wanna operate their spaces? Are they gonna wanna be in, in different modes at different times? Um, it's tempting in suites like this uh, to use one, one fan coil in the, like a, a wall pack in the open space, but whenever possible, we're pushing people to do ducted fan coils because, uh, first of all, we're getting distribution into the bedroom, right? It's guaranteed in this way, and we're getting the right amount of heating and cooling delivered into the bedroom, but also it gives us the ability to do superior filtration instead of just, you know, the filters that are built into the wall packs that are really just there to protect the coil. We didn't get maybe as large a filter as I would like on the back of this because of the jump uh, limitations of the building, but uh, at least there's something. There's a secondary filter there, a disposable filter that can be changed, especially considering it's pulling air from effectively within the kitchen. So that was, that was important. Um, I think if we could do this again on the next building, I would probably uh, look at, there's some other manufacturers where you can orient those units uh, vertically, so they could probably have been fit into the mechanical room which makes maintenance easier. It gives you the opportunity to, 
to build a larger return plenum and really slow the air down to do a better quality filtration system. So something to think about. But for now, the only requirement the architect really cared about for ceiling height was that the, uh, the main space be nine feet, which it is. So we only really dropped the kitchen and the, uh, the bedroom to make this work. <coughs> so uh, the last point I want to make is we pushed them to do heat pump dryers in this building, which they, uh, it obviously wasn't their, their starting point for them. They'd never done it before. Um, the big, you know, the thing everyone was most concerned about was slow drying time, of course. And here they did keep one dryer for every washing machine. We subsequently done some MERBs where the owners have opted to double up two dryers for every washing machine. Um, I haven't had any feedback yet about whether this has been problematic for them, wait, waiting for the drying time, and maybe with the demographic in the building, it won't be, I'm not sure. But um, another problem is the lack of coin-operated options uh, on the market right now. So they obviously you can see the washing machine's coin-operated, uh, but the, the vendor that they work with uh, doesn't offer heat pump dryers uh, as coin-operated yet. Uh, so their solution was just to buy them and give drying for free. So they're paying for washing, but they're not paying for drying. Um, some of the other challenges with this are heat rejection into the space, because now we're not ducting all that heat outside the building as we normally would be. There's obviously an energy benefit to not having makeup air. Uh, but the other thing is different maintenance requirements. So for those of you who are not familiar with heat pump dryers, there's a secondary filter here. There's still the regular filter inside here to catch lint, but this needs to be cleaned in my experience, every few loads, so they're going to need to be aware of that. We made the, the property manager aware of that, but someone's going to have to be on that to make sure that they're going around and checking that that's done. And I think that's it, so thank you very much. Thank you.